Hi students, welcome to Preliminary Chemistry and the Water Topic. This is the penultimate video in the Water Topic on molar heats of solution, and it's number 22. Mole heat of solution is a measure of the energy change which occurs when one mole of a substance dissolves in water. We've already looked at the specific heat of water and we've identified the fact that uh, specific heat is related to the amount of energy needed to heat one gram of a substance up by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. Now we're looking at what actually happens when we dissolve substances in water. Molar heat, obviously that molar word relates to a mole. And heat of solution is a term which we describe to um, the amount of heat that's released when a solution is created. Now there's two possibilities. Um, one is that the um, reaction will release heat to the surroundings that will create a negative delta H value. And, um, and it will mean that the reaction can be regarded as being exothermic. However, uh, it's also possible that the energy could be absorbed from the surroundings and therefore the delta H value will be a positive value. And of course, that will be an endothermic uh, dissolution, uh, formation of a solution. What we, what we may find, what you may find when you're doing a little bit of additional reading around is that the delta H value often comes with a number of subscripts just to identify the particular type of reaction that we are measuring. Now we don't look at a lot of different ones in this course, so you won't see too many of them, but you may see um, this kind of notation. And that is something like this delta H with the subscript SOL to indicate the heat of solution. Now we're using the MCAT formula. Uh, I mentioned this on a previous video and it's really important that uh, you are aware of this formula. You, often you'll be given it on your data sheets, but I hope you'll do enough examples that it'll become uh, automatic first nature to you. Now the delta H value is the change in heat energy and that is measured in joules. Often the value is very large, so we may uh, express our number in kilojoules, but to do that we'd have to divide whatever we get by a thousand, so just make sure you do the conversion factor. But often these numbers are very, very large. The mass of the substance in grams, the specific heat capacity in joules per Kelvin per gram, and then also the change in temperature. Remember from the previous video on calorimetry that the specific heat capacity that we will almost always use is the value of water, which is 4.2 or sometimes 4.18 joules uh, per Kelvin per gram. Now, because it's a solution, it won't exactly be that, but for all practical purposes, we will consider that we are using this value um, and recognize there may be some small error associated with that. The delta T value, of course, is the change in temperature of the medium in uh, Kelvin, so the, the units of delta T are in Kelvin, and as I've mentioned previously, that could be a, an increase or a decrease in temperature. So once we start to actually do some testing, and you will carry out some experiments on this in class, if the temperature is rising, so the temperature goes up, then that means that, say, we go from a temperature of 20 degrees to a temperature of 30 degrees. Celsius, then this is a 10 degrees Celsius or a 10 Kelvin change. Um, that is going to mean that the delta H, uh, the delta T value is going to be greater than zero, and therefore the delta H value is going to be negative. If the temperature falls, so uh, a falling temperature means maybe we start with 20 degrees and we go to 10 degrees, so therefore the change is going to be minus 10 degrees or minus 10 Kelvin, then our delta T value will be less than zero. And because a negative multiplied by a negative is a positive, our delta H value will be positive, And therefore, this will be an endothermic process. This one above is exo. Heats of solution can be carried out in a beaker. Um, you can just um, put some water, uh, measure out a certain amount of water into a beaker and then add your solute to form the solution. But the problem with that is that the beaker itself uh, is not a particularly good device to use as a calorimeter. Remember, one of the assumptions is that we won't have um, 
energy exchange between the container or between the container and the surroundings, and the beaker is more likely to do this. So um, that's why most of the, um, or certainly as far as we're concerned in the classroom, any of the testing that we're doing to calculate heats of solution will be carried out in styrofoam cups, just because they're better at insulating, keeping all of the heat within the container, which means we we reduce at least the number of heat losses there are with the surroundings and also with the container. One good example of an exothermic dissolution is sodium hydroxide. So the important thing when you're writing these, um, I might just change the color of that, is that we have sodium hydroxide, which is a solid. And when it goes into solution, it forms sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And this will have a delta H value if it is exothermic, which is negative. And an example of an endothermic process will be the dissolution of ammonium chloride. So this is ammonium chloride, again a solid which we dissolve in water, and it will form the ions ammonium and chlorine, and its delta H value will be positive. We'll have a look at a, an example in the final video in this series, um, but that's pretty much for this one, so thanks for watching.